Welcome to this session of the Center for Podiatric Education. And in this session, I want to speak about something that is really almost a, a daily part of my practice. Um, you know, I, as I've gotten older, really have come to enjoy office practice a great deal more, perhaps more than I ever enjoyed uh, surgical practice. I find the challenge of uh, general podiatry um, exciting. We see a variety of medical disorders. We're in a position to assist patients. Uh, oftentimes these are problems that we don't treat ourselves, although we may participate in the treatment, but we find ourselves in a position to make appropriate referrals to other health care providers and improve quality of life, at times save limbs, uh, prevent uh, more significant pathology. As podiatrists, we see increasingly uh, large numbers of older patients, and we see uh, increasing numbers of uh, patients with vascular disease and with certain neurologic disorders, uh, including neuropathy associated with diabetes. And I really enjoy uh, the general practice of primary care podiatry, making these diagnoses, working people up, and again, doing the appropriate diagnostic studies and making appropriate referrals, and I hope you do too. I think it's something that is, frankly, under-emphasized in uh, podiatry. Uh, I sometimes worry that perhaps there's a bit too much emphasis in surgery. But in any event, I'd like to talk about vascular versus neuropathic pain and the differential diagnosis in patients who come to us with leg pain or foot pain and are seeking a, a diagnosis and treatment. In most of these patients, I do uh, work these patients up myself. I take a, a good history. I perform, I think, a very reasonable physical examination. I will oftentimes order the preliminary diagnostic studies and then initiate uh, my portion of treatment with appropriate referral back to the primary care physician. With reference to uh, pain, uh, certainly as podiatric physicians we are always concerned about uh, pain due to inflammatory arthritis and other rheumatic disorders. We are certainly always concerned about musculoskeletal uh, discomfort. Uh, I do want to talk today about vascular pain versus neuropathic pain. We know that vascular pain is secondary to uh, some lack of blood flow with or without a component of ischemic neuropathy. So we may have uh, occlusive disease stenosis with ischemia. Uh, less commonly, we may see vasculitic problems, particularly in patients who have connective tissue disorders. We may see patients who have vaso spastic disorders, and we may see some of this in cold weather. And then we get the occasional patient with compression uh, syndromes involving uh, their vascular flow. And as uncommon as this may seem to be, I can tell you that as of this recording, just in the last two years, I've had three cases of uh, compartment syndromes associated with exercise uh, two of which required uh, fascial releases, uh, which uh, I did, and one of which required a vascular intervention and turned out to be associated with a popliteal artery aneurysm, which uh, admittedly I was not aware was uh, present. And then we have neuropathic pain, and uh, neuropathic pain most typically associated with peripheral neuropathies in the podiatry practice, and of those, the most common presenting form would that would be that of diabetic neuropathy. We see neuropathic pain from entrapment neuropathies, and uh, most commonly in podiatry would be uh, tarsal tunnel syndrome, uh, less commonly entrapments of the common or distal branches of the perineal nerve, and spinal compression syndromes, which I think we tend to not think about quite as frequently. I've always had an interest in back pain and radicular symptoms involving the lower extremity. I hope many of you do also, and there's no reason why the average podiatric physician cannot conduct a basic examination for uh, lumbosacral uh, 
uh, entrapments and make an appropriate referral to back to the primary care physician, possibly to a physiatrist or orthopedic spine or a neurospine. Now, one of the tricky things that we see, particularly in the elderly patient, is the coexistence of both neuropathy and vascular disease in the same patient. They are not mutually exclusive. And I've had a number of patients over the years referred to me in which, for example, a diagnosis was made of vascular disease and a, an appropriate workup and intervention was performed in that regard. The patient had recalcitrant pain and what they had was an undiagnosed neuropathy in the same patient. So don't uh, make the mistake of believing that once you diagnose either vascular or neurologic disorders responsible for pain or cramping, that this is uh, meaning the other uh, possibilities are excluded. We want to remember that in, in some respects, the symptoms of vascular pain and neurologic pain are similar. For example, we know that neuropathic pain, uh, the pain associated with neuropathy, the paresthesias and dysesthesias, for example, are frequently more common in the evening hours, and so is cramping and pain with vascular disease. And we talk about uh, rest pain as one of the end-stage manifestations of uh, vascular disease. Similarly, cramping when walking. We talk about intermittent claudication. And we ask the patient whether they cramp when they're walking and do they stop and how do they respond to that pain. But we want to remember that neurologic pain associated with uh, entities such as spinal stenosis or associated with venous disease uh, also can be associated with cramping when walking. Uh, similarly, uh, popliteal aneurysms and some less common uh, pathologic conditions. And again, uh, both neuropathy and vascular disease can be present in a patient with relatively minimal symptomatology. When we work up patients for uh, vascular disease, in addition to uh, our uh, basic medical history and physical examination, we look at the comorbid conditions that are present in that patient. And so, for example, we may see the patient that has a coronary disease. They may have had some carotid artery disease or renal disease. They're hypertensive. Uh, they have uh, elevated uh, cholesterol levels. And, and we, they have multiple confounding uh, factors, co comorbid conditions, with which vascular disease is associated. But if you uh, study or read up on a neuropathic disease, you find that the incidence of neuropathy is increased in these same patients with the same comorbid conditions. So yes, the presence of comorbid conditions like hypertension and dyslipidemia, increasing age, tobacco use, the diabetes, uh, hyperhomocysteinemia, these are factors that are associated with increased risk of vascular disease, but they are also associated with increased risk of peripheral neuropathy. And we know increasingly that, particularly in the diabetic patient, that the peripheral neuropathy, when all is said and done, results in oxidative stress and decreased nerve vascular perfusion. So that while diabetic neuropathy is a metabolic disorder, and we can describe a number of abnormalities in uh, nerve metabolism in the diabetic patient. Uh, the bottom line is that when, when we get to the common uh, uh, thread of all of these things, it is decreased vascular perfusion to the nerves and, and somewhat of a, and this may be overly simplistic, I suppose, but it makes diabetic neuropathy uh, almost a form of ischemic neuropathy. And many of the therapies that we utilize for the actual treatment of the disease, not the symptoms, are, are actually treatments that involve trying to increase blood flow to the nerves themselves to reduce the symptoms of symptomatic diabetic neuropathy. We also want to remember that in certain disorders, particularly diabetic patients, we know that entrapment neuropathies are more common, so that we want to look for entrapments of the common perineal nerve or the deep or superficial perineal nerves, uh, entities such as tarsal tunnel syndrome. And overall, 
We know that about one-third of patients with diabetes have some form of entrapment neuropathy. Uh, they also are more prone to develop acute uh, mononeuritic uh, signs and symptoms. We also have the effects of comorbid conditions, uh, osteoarthritis of the hips or knees causing pain, and we have medication effects which can contribute uh, mostly to uh, uh, neuropathic uh, conditions and many of the, the medications our patients take have the potential for neuropathy as a side effect. So sometimes um, it's important to look at the medications the patient's taking to see whether or not that may be a cause of their neuropathic symptoms. So we know again that entities like tarsal tunnel syndrome, anterior tarsal tunnel and so forth are much more common in the diabetic patient. A substantial uh, portion of patients with diabetes do have uh, neuropathy. The majority have uh, peripheral uh, diabetic uh, sensory neuropathy. We want to remember that there is a good percentage of patients that develop autonomic neuropathy, and many patients develop motor neuropathy and may have cramping in their legs or feet as a manifestation of that neuropathy. And all too frequently, we forget that uh, many diabetic patients have motor neuropathy and can develop symptoms associated with that. And about 30% of patients with diabetic neuropathy are painful and requires some type of anti-nociceptive therapy. If we look at the symptoms of peripheral neuropathy, and in particular diabetic neuropathy, all of us know there is paresthesia and dysesthesia and numbness and so forth. But keep in mind that both with small fiber and large fiber neuropathy, patients can present with symptoms such as deep aching pain, uh, cramping pain, as well as burning pain. And, uh, and again, uh, we have to be careful not to attribute symptoms such as aching or cramping as being strictly musculoskeletal in nature, and that this can be associated with diabetic sensory and, uh, at times, uh, possibly motor neuropathy. What about the patient that talks about, quote, claudication? And all of us know that claudication refers to a cramping or tightness that occurs with walking and is generally relieved with a rest. Well, certainly um, the old rule that uh, the first thing you do in any differential diagnosis is think of the worst thing that a patient can have and rule that out initially. And we, we certainly want to be aware that uh, vascular claudication may be present in a patient. So any patient presenting with claudication symptoms to us, we have an obligation to either evaluate that patient for the presence of vascular disease, order appropriate testing, or make an, a referral to rule out the presence of arterial disease. We also have patients that get muscle cramping. And um, we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we have probably the entity that, in my opinion, tends to go underdiagnosed in podiatry, uh, and that is pseudoclaudication, cramping due to most commonly lumbar spinal stenosis. This is a, a common entity. Uh, it is not uh, rare by any means. Uh, it's not difficult to evaluate patients for spinal stenosis, or at least if you uh, don't want to do this yourself, make a referral back to the primary with a note saying, uh, hey, I, I, I just want to know whether or not this patient has evidence of uh, nerve root entrapment and has pseudoclaudication. Uh, disc herniations can certainly be a, a problem. Uh, uh, str uh, compression fractures associated with osteoporosis and hopefully not, but we always want to consider the possibility of neoplastic disease, particularly metastatic disease or diseases like uh, multiple myeloma. As far as normal leg cramping goes, uh, which may occur during evening hours or may occur with walking, most common causes generally are related to fatigue. Uh, we want to look and see whether or not the patient is taking a diuretic or some uh, medication that might influence electrolyte uh, uh, abnormalities. Uh, generally, the uh, things that we will screen patients for include hyponatremia, hypokalemia, uh, lower magnesium levels, hypocalcemia, uh, or dehydration, which is a very common cause of cramping and oftentimes just uh, 
speaking with the patient and encouraging greater hydration is sufficient to relieve some cramping. We can also have cramping uh, for other causes such as venous disease. Taking a moment to look at pseudoclaudication, uh, I personally make a number of referrals every year out of my office to orthopedic spine or to neurosurgery. Uh, sometimes, uh, not infrequently, I will refer to uh, a chiropractor for evaluation. But these are patients that have lower extremity pain. They get cramping when walking. They, if you ask them, generally have a history of uh, low back pain. And it's quite common. It affects, it affects about one out of every eight community-dwelling men. And, uh, and if you look at retirement communities, about one out of every five patients uh, does, in fact, have spinal stenosis. And if you speak to the patient for a minute, you'll get histories of pain in the legs or feet, weakness, tingling, fatigue, a sense of heaviness, which also may be associated with a venous disease. And frequently, the symptoms, of, not exclusively, but frequently, the symptoms are bilateral uh, in nature. This is not a rare entity. We see this frequently in our offices, and it may be the sole cause for lower extremity pathology. It may be superimposed on other coexisting problems. And uh, I'll ask about bladder or bowel dysfunction. And I've always been a strong advocate of doing a neurologic exam in the office so that at a minimum, you want to test for muscle strength, you want to do reflexes, and you want to test for uh, sensation. That would be the absolute minimum uh, that you would do. Now, in inquiring about neurogenic claudication, all of us know that with vascular claudication, the patient will say that they walk a fixed distance, their legs start to cramp, or their foot starts to cramp, and then they stop. And uh, they recirculate, and reperfuse, walk again until they hit that uh, specific distance again, and then stop again. People with neurogenic claudication tend to tell a different story. Generally, they tend to sit down uh, and bend forward, because by doing that, they're relieving uh, disc pressure and sometimes pressure in the uh, intervertebral foramina from discogenic stenosis uh, or uh, foraminal stenosis. Um, oftentimes, they complain about pain when walking downhill, because when you walk downhill, you tend to lean backwards. It is uh, uh, placing greater pressure on the nerve roots. Um, if uh, you want to uh, have a simple test to test for pseudoclaudication, the patient can exercise on a stationary bike until they initiate symptoms. And you'll see that patients with pseudoclaudication want to lean forward uh, in order to relieve that pain. It's always been said that if you listen to the patient long enough, uh, you'll get the diagnosis. And if you make the inquiries, you'll see that oftentimes the patients with pseudoclaudication or uh, a herniated disc will describe their pain uh, and almost draw out the sciatic nerve. Uh, and uh, they'll trace it down the back of their buttock and the posterior aspect of their thigh. And they describe the pain as having ridiculous characteristics so that if you listen carefully, you certainly are likely to make the diagnosis or at least have an arousal of the suspicion for spinal stenosis. Uh, most commonly, it's degenerative spondylolisthesis if it's not true spinal stenosis. Far less commonly, we see diseases uh, such as ankylosing spondylitis. We do get these patients occasionally, but certainly not common in everyday podiatry practice. You can do a small neurologic examination in the office. There's nothing that prevents you from taking uh, reflexes, from doing manual muscle testing, from doing straight leg raising, from doing a bit of simple palpation, and, uh, and uh, proceeding forward from that point. Again, so it's really not all that difficult to uh, continue on. The plantar flexors of the foot are primarily S1, S2, not exclusively. Uh, everters tend to be uh, primarily S1. Inverters tend to be primarily um, 
L4. So um, if we're going to have entrapment of particular nerve roots, we may see significant weakness of certain muscle groups over others. So listening carefully to claudication, patients with chronic venous insufficiency that have swelling, varicose veins, uh, they tend to have uh, claudication involving the entire leg and they describe a sensation of swelling or bursting. It generally has a gradual onset after they begin to walk. Patients with arteriosclerotic disease and have vascular claudification. Uh, the level of claudication obviously depends on the level of the occlusion. And obviously the uh, symptoms are going to occur just below the level of occlusion. So that depending on whether the uh, vascular disease is in the distal aorta, in the uh, iliac arteries or femoral arteries, popliteal arteries, or distally, we may have pain in the calf or the thigh or the buttock when walking. If it is due to femoral popliteal disease, then we tend to get unilateral disease. Obviously, if it is in the aortoiliac system at the bifurcation or just prior to the bifurcation, then the symptoms may in fact be uh, bilateral. Typically, the patients walk, they get pain, they have a fixed claudication distance. They will stop walking and then continue once they are reperfused. The claudication distance tends not to change. So the patients generally can tell you I could walk uh, two blocks or one and a half blocks or one block and then the symptoms occur. And of course, we're going to combine this history with an appropriate vascular evaluation, assessment of pulses, dependent rubor, plantar ischemia, and so forth. Again, with neurogenic uh, pseudoclaudication, um, there is a description that sounds neurologic in nature. There may be some paresthesia or dysesthesia. There may be some numbness. There may be some muscle weakness. Uh, the symptoms of pseudoclaudication tend to be uh, bilateral, although they can be unilateral. It is relieved when the patient sits down and tends to lean forward to relieve pressure uh, on the uh, nerve roots. And again, there may be some additional symptoms in terms of bladder or bowel function or um, certainly weakness uh, to suggest a neurologic basis. Rest pain uh, is uh, frequently something that occurs at night, but can also occur with advanced levels of ischemia. Uh, we also want to consider the possibility of restless leg syndrome. And there are patients that consult us with nocturnal muscle cramping. willis ekbom uh, disease or restless leg syndrome, uh, as you know, is the patient that on questioning will tell us that they have pain and they have an urge to move their leg. This is what relieves the pain. Uh, it is worse during the nighttime hours, and it is worse at rest. And uh, this would be your classic uh, definition for uh, restless leg syndrome. Now, this is not to be confused with the Jimmy leg that was described on Seinfeld by uh, Kramer, and that would be a jerking motion while sleeping, and it may cause relationship problems, not allowing a patient to sleep with one's partner. And uh, if those of you interested in the Jimmy leg would want to seek out the appropriate episode of Seinfeld for further definition. As far as treatment of restless leg syndrome, we want to remember that restless leg syndrome can be part of uh, neuropathy. It can be an actual manifestation of neuropathy. We certainly want to rule out other uh, factors that might be operative. You might want to think a little bit about uh, sleep apnea and whether the patient needs a referral to be evaluated for that. You want to think about electrolyte abnormalities. And certainly the dopamine agonists uh, have been shown to be uh, effective and uh, an appropriate treatment in many patients. Other causes of nocturnal cramping in the legs uh, would include not only uh, arterial disease and peripheral neuropathy, but venous insufficiency, other disorders such as renal disease and thyroid disease, particularly a hypothyroid, uh, may cause cramping during the evening hours. Uh, cramping is not uncommon in pregnancy. Uh, it may be associated with diabetic neuropathy. 
as well as diabetic motor neuropathy. And then we have certainly uh, less common conditions, but we do want to make some inquiries. For example, in the case of, of uh, multiple sclerosis, about any uh, visual difficulties, look for some cerebellar signs, check the patient walking for any ataxia, and this type of thing. <clears throat> Patients not uncommonly will uh, ask their podiatric physician about nocturnal leg cramping, and this typically involves the uh, calf muscles and the soles of the feet. If the cramping is particularly um, uh, significant, uh, there may be some persistent muscle pain and soreness that can persist into the next day. Again, we always want to uh, evaluate the patient for arterial disease, we always want to evaluate the patient for uh, venous disease. We want to know if they have been exercising a good deal or if there are any inciting factors preceding the nocturnal cramping. Uh, once again, this is not at all an uncommon complaint in uh, association with pregnancy. Uh, oftentimes, rehydration. Perhaps these patients are simply dehydrated and simply recommending uh, increased Fluid intake in some patients is sufficient to resolve nocturnal cramping. We certainly want to look at their electrolytes, and again, particularly in medications such as diuretics that tend to deplete uh, electrolytes in patients. There are some medications uh, other than diuretics that are associated with cramping, and probably the best known would be the statin drugs. It's been estimated that 80% of athletes who use statin drugs and 25% of all patients using statin drugs do develop uh, cramping. And one of the um, things that one can do is CoQ10. CoQ10 is very helpful for cramping due to statin drugs. Um, that is because uh, um, these drugs are associated with depletion of ATP and muscle ATP is responsible for muscle relaxation so that when we have decreased mitochondrial production of ATP uh, in the muscle, there's a tendency towards cramping. Coenzyme Q uh, needs to be replaced as this is uh, utilized and um, becomes depleted in some patients taking statin drugs. The other class of drugs that frequently will cause cramping are drugs used to treat asthma or COPD. And so again, it's oftentimes helpful to look at that list of drugs that the patient is taking because they may be taking a medication that is in fact inducing their cramping. With regard to vascular cramping, there are a number of relatively safe options uh, for the podiatric physician. We certainly want to uh, order uh, or perform uh, formalized uh, Doppler studies and, if necessary, refer the patient to interventional cardiology or interventional radiology or vascular surgery uh, for uh, consideration of appropriate testing and intervention. Uh, one of the drugs that is safe and frequently effective is Vascuprax. Um, you do want to adjust the uh, dosage or be careful with the medication in patients with uh, hepatic disorders uh, or uh, advanced stages of uh, renal disease. The dosage is 100 milligrams three times a day. Pentoxifiline um, is actually quite helpful for a number of patients. It's uh, useful in venous disease, actually, but pentoxifiline, I find, is a uh, safe drug that again uh, does help some patients with uh, cramping, uh, vascular cramping, and the dosage is 400 milligrams three times a day. Uh, so stays all a uh, relatively safe drug, 100 milligrams BID. With reference to neuropathy, uh, we want to take an appropriate history, perform an appropriate examination. Generally, the standard uh, when suspicious is that of electrodiagnostic studies with electromyography or nerve conduction studies. We do want to remember that these uh, nerve conduction studies are a reflection of large fiber, not small fiber neuropathy. And one can have uh, small fiber neuropathy, have symptoms from that small fiber neuropathy, and yet have a normal nerve conduction study.
so that while nerve conduction studies are considered the uh, standard uh, for initial screening, they will not uh, confirm the presence of small fiber disease. Uh, if we have uh, autonomic neuropathy, then uh, there are certain tests uh, that can be done, such as uh, sweat gland uh, biopsy with a 3 millimeter putch, or acustite studies or other uh, um, techniques that can be utilized for the evaluation of neuropathy. But in general, uh, no advanced studies are required. Uh, generally, uh, a, a good history and neurologic examination is sufficient to make the diagnosis in over 80% of patients. And so uh, if there is still a question in your mind, then you want to consider appropriate additional advanced neurologic testing. But the majority of patients can be diagnosed without the need for additional testing. So that this, for example, is a tabletop in my office. And if you go into any room in my particular office, you will find this in these instruments in every single room uh, for a basic screen. And uh, this is more than sufficient to diagnose uh, the presence of neuropathy in 80 to 90 percent of all patients without the need for advanced testing. With regard to treatment of neuropathy pain, uh, we still basically look at uh, adjunctive analgesic therapy for symptomatic neuropathy for the treatment of symptoms. This includes the antidepressants, the tricyclic antidepressants, the serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, uh, anticonvulsants are still commonly utilized, and there is a place uh, for uh, opioid and non-opioid analgesics is in terms of restoring nerve health, because we want to remember that analgesics do not, uh, if you will, fix the problem. They don't actually resolve the neuropathy. We know that in diabetic, uh, there's decreased nerve blood flow. So we certainly want to recommend control of diabetes, number one, as the uh, mainstay for treatment. Uh, alpha lipoic acid has been shown to be extremely helpful in many patients. L-carnitine, also uh, extremely helpful. Now, when utilizing these products, you want to remember that dosage is also important. With alpha-lipoic acid, you want a minimum of 600 milligrams a day, up to 1,800 milligrams per day. Uh, carnitine, uh, L-carnitine, you're looking at uh, a, a typical dose of 1 to 2 grams uh, per day. Uh, it, we have uh, well-established data to show that many diabetic patients are B12 deficient or have a functional B12 deficiency. Many patients uh, have a lack of uh, the ability to convert folic acid into its active form L-methylfolate. And many patients, by simply supplementing their diet with L-methylfolate, uh, pyridoxal B-phosphate, and, uh, and, uh, and methylcobalamin, uh, and given some time and proper control of their diabetes uh, will, in fact, uh, do quite well in resolving their symptoms. There is also increasing data that uh, many diabetic patients are vitamin D deficient, and supplementation with vitamin D is adequate to resolve some of their symptoms. So if we look at current treatments, they really haven't changed much over the years in terms of antidepressants, anticonvulsants, and the use of uh, analgesics, and uh, other things that can certainly be done would include topical uh, lidocaine if you have focal uh, evidence of uh, entrapment. It's also important to remember that on average, um, patients taking uh, analgesic therapy for diabetic neuropathy uh, do require more than one drug. So it's, it's unusual, really, to administer one medication and uh, get 100% improvement in symptoms. So that oftentimes we have to combine adjunctive analgesics or combine an adjunctive analgesic with uh, efforts to restore blood flow, uh, whether your choice is going to be a, um, a vitamin B complex with L-methylfolate, methylcobalamin, and pyridoxal 5-phosphate, uh, or whether you're going to use, a, um, again, alpha lipoic acid or carnitine. Uh, 
is going to be something that you're going to base on your uh, practice habit and uh, ob observation of the patient and their individual response. With regard to vascular disease, this is certainly the most important thing to rule out initially. And at a minimum, you want to do ankle uh, brachial indices uh, in the office as a basic screening. And uh, we know that uh, patients with ABIs less than 0.9 are considered to be uh, manifesting early vascular disease. Rest pain generally occurs when we have ABIs less than 0.5, and uh, below that we start to worry about tissue loss. Claudication generally between 0.9 and 0.5 will occur. Where one goes in the evaluation of these patients is strictly a function of your individual comfort. And, um, you may perform the examination and screening Dopplers and then refer the patient off for formalized Dopplers. Some podiatric physicians uh, utilize services to perform the formalized Doppler studies in their offices. Uh, and then uh, when there's confirmation of this disease, referral to an appropriate uh, healthcare provider for angiography uh, and intervention or whatever uh, workup is, uh, is appropriate. There are advantages and disadvantages to the uh, various forms of workup. Certainly, uh, ultrasound is a relatively inexpensive means to perform uh, a good screening. Uh, DSAs, uh, MRAs are available, and, and so forth. Generally, when I communicate with my vascular or cardiology uh, colleagues, I utilize the Rutherford classification system for describing their level of vascular disease. So zero would be the patient who's asymptomatic. One is mild claudication. Rutherford two, moderate claudication. Rutherford three is severe claudication. Rutherford four is the patient with ischemic rest pain. Rutherford five, uh, the patient with tissue loss and Rutherford 6, the patient with major tissue loss. And there are some therapies that are based on Rutherford classification. Certainly this is not uh, uh, absolute, but there are a number of things that have been looked at and recommended by the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology. And many of these are, are, are uh, therapies that are certainly things the podiatric physician can uh, contribute. For example, uh, increasing uh, exercise tolerance uh, uh, by increasing exercise programs for the patient. The use of Playtow, uh, Silastazol, 100 milligrams BID. We've talked about pentoxifiline, 400 milligrams TID. Arginine, you want to remember that arginine is a basic building block, not only for collagen, but also for nitric oxide and uh, it is arginine that donates the nitrogen that combines with oxygen to form nitric oxide, which is a very powerful vasodilator, as you know. And uh, many of our patients, for example, with declining renal function uh, and certain GI problems will have lower uh, levels of arginine. Arginine, for example, we know is synthesized in the kidney so that uh, oftentimes supplementing uh, the patient's uh, diet with three grams of uh, arginine three times a day uh, may be helpful in increasing nitric oxide levels and reducing claudication symptoms. Uh, we've talked about uh, car L-carnitine, which again, uh, one to two grams per day is uh, where you want to be. Ginkgo biloba has been recommended uh, by the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology is being helpful in some patients, about 120 to 160 milligrams per day, uh, vitamin E, uh, somewhere around 50 milligrams per day. Again, we want to always remember some of the other issues that can cause uh, cramping uh, and pain in the legs, uh, stress uh, injuries to the uh, tibia can occur, Exertional compartment syndromes are not that rare if you look for them. Uh, don't forget that entrapments of the perineal nerve are not at all uncommon. So in summary, as podiatric physicians in primary care practice, we frequently are called upon for the evaluation of cramping and pain in the lower extremities. And yes, we're going to look for musculoskeletal disorders, and yes, we're going to look for 
rheumatic disorders, but it's also important to look for vascular and neurologic etiologies, particularly pseudoclonication in our older patients or, or the presence of arterial disease. We want to remember that venous disease can also be a common cause of cramping. So we want to go ahead and do a complete thorough vascular history and vascular examination. We want to do a complete neurologic examination. And uh, if you have a question regarding pseudoclonication, one can certainly get the patient on a stationary bike and see whether or not when their symptoms occur, they're relieved by anterior flexion, suggesting that pseudoclonication is more likely the etiology. Uh, hopefully this will encourage some of you who may not be as involved to get more involved in this discrimination. Uh, patients are dependent upon us uh, for these things, and I think that working patients up for these problems in a proper manner and making these diagnoses makes the practice of podiatry uh, much more interesting and much more enjoyable. Thank you.